Right, I'll bring us back together for our, um, our final session here. So we have uh, one more talk, and then we're, we're looking forward to hearing uh, some remarks from, from David Cox later. Um, just to say, after this session um, ends, there will be some, some wine and other drinks available if you don't have to dash off. Obviously, we will understand um, if you do. Um, I, I realize that since Simon thanked me, I, I need to return the favor. Thanks, Simon, for, for uh, sort of uh, taking an overview of the conference, and especially to Bianca, wherever she's gone, for uh, the lion's share of the local organization. So thank you very much for, for making it happen here. That's been great. Um, right. I shall, uh, I shall hand over to Robin Henderson. Rob, Rob was uh, my PhD supervisor, um, and uh, among the many things that I learned about him during that time was that he, he is a yes man. Um, and uh, <laughs> that has landed him the job of head of school uh, in the Maths and Stats uh, group in Newcastle. It's also landed him the, the job of uh, closing out the, the scientific content here today. So over to you, Rob. Thank you, Daniel. I'm not, not sure if thanks are right there, but there, there we go. <laughs> um, I've known Daniel for about 10 years. C is, is this microphone working? No? about that? No difference? I suppose I should say something. I've known Daniel for about 10 years and throughout that time I've tried to teach him bad habits and I've failed throughout. He's just a really nice person. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 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 that's the nearest he's come to an insult to me all, all, in all, these, all this time. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the attempts to develop measures that explain variation for survival or more general event history data over the last 20 or so years. There have been lots and lots, far too many to talk about, so I'm going to concentrate on the ones that I've been involved with, that I know something about, and I'm going to almost totally ignore everybody else's work except where I'm being critical of it. <laughs> um, I'm going to use explain variation in a very, very broad sense to mean any attempt to quantify what we gained from knowing covariates, what extra information we have having found covariates compared to what we had beforehand. So this might be smaller residuals, smaller variances, better predictions, better discrimination, higher likelihoods, more precise estimation, whatever. Perhaps not more pr precise estimation. Very, very broad definition. Um, when I was in invited, I remembered that I had a paper um, in the 1990s that included a section 21 years of proportional hazards. Uh, it's hard to believe that, that this is 20 years ago. <laughs> but, uh, and that's because it's not 20 years ago. Uh, if you look at the date of the talk, it's 1995, which tells you something about my mental arithmetic <laughs> or, or the publication delays there were in those days. And in fact, we probably still have delays like that. So 21 years uh, of proportional hazards and then another 20 on top of that. Daniel's asked me to ask the audience to show your hands if you were present in 1972. So could I ask for that, please? And, and what we would like is at the end, if you, you people could come forward and, and we'll take a photograph, or Daniel will take a <laughs> photograph. Yeah? Uh, so if that's okay. If you don't mind, please, please don't forget to do that. I think that would be better after Sir David has spoken. Okay, so... Um, at the time that, that, that I wrote that little section, I, I was working on how accurate doctors' predictions of survival are for the terminally ill. And that took me into predictive accuracy, uh, measures of predictive, uh, predictive accuracy, and explain variation. And I came across a couple um, that Michael Schemper had created in a biometric paper around about 1991, something like that. And I really liked them, and I recommended them. Uh, I missed the bus, uh, because at the same time, um, Graf and Schumacher investigated properties of, of these measures uh, and, and came up with a, the, in, in academic speak, the conclusion that they were no good. Okay, so it's a, a matter of debate. That's a phrase that Sir David might have used when he, when he absolutely hates something. Um, I, thought, I thought we'd start by just, just looking through what these measures proposed by Schemper were and why they didn't work and how they might be fixed. So Schemper's uh, idea, like, like all the best ones, is very simple. He said... We work with um, single event survival data. Here are just to illustrate four people's survival times. His proposal was to take each person, consider that person as a sample of size one, and fit a Kaplan-Meier curve to that sample of size one. And we get something like that. 
Okay, so everybody starts at 1, and they drop to 0 with a step of size 1. And then what we'll, we'll do is compare those observed kaplan Myers with our fitted survivor curves without covariance, sorry, with covariance. So you fit your model, and you get your estimated survivor curve, uh, and then we compare them with the observed kaplan Meyer curve. And that's as close as you can get in survival to comparing observed and fitted uh, values. Uh, his proposal was to, to look at only the event times. So if I can use the mouse, maybe. Here there are four event times. Uh, we'll take, the, let's say, the, the blue one, and we'll compare the red curve with the expected survival curve. And look at that distance, either the absolute distance or the square of it. Whereas the, this color, whatever the color this is, the, the light blue, that's also the same distance. The green person's already down at one, so they've got a, a larger distance. And we'll use that as a measure of distance between observed and, and fitted curves. We'll do that also with the marginal survival curve, so the black line on there. And we would hope that the conditional survival curves, given covariates, match the observed data more closely than the marginal one does. And we'll estimate that through um, the distance between the observed data and the marginal, d naught, and the observed data and the conditionals, dx. And we'll get a measure of explained variation in that way. If we turn to censoring, so what I've done now is censor that first person here, uh, then the, there are two consequences. We get the uh, survivor curves, as previously, but now the kaplan Meyer for that person is left waving in the wind at the end here. Um, it, it doesn't drop to zero. Then when we compare with our fitted curves, um, we have two effects. One is at the later survival times, we don't know what that person's status is. So at the blue time, we don't know whether that person was alive or dead. That's one effect. And the other one is we've lost one of our event times. Uh, we've only got three now. We had four that we looked at previously. And that leads to these measures being affected by the amount of censoring you have and the pattern of censoring. And you get different results depending upon uh, whether you've got censored or not censored data, no matter how large the sample is. Uh, and so that was a critical criticism of it. And the fix... Uh, was to introduce inverse probability censoring. Uh, and at the time of the millennium, when this was done, this was quite new. Uh, it's obviously ubiquitous now. Speaking of the, the millennium, I'm, I'm going to break off now and um, embarrass Sir David by reminding you of an article... No, I'm not. It's the wrong version of the talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Who knows what's coming next? <laughs> um, well, I'll speak about it then. There was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2001 that looked at the top 11 contributions to medicine over the previous 1,000 years. And it had anatomy, physiology, things like that. And fourth in the list was statistics. It's not often you can say we're proud to be statisticians, but you can then when it was fourth in the list. It was actually in time order, not in, 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 in rank order. And the reason it was fourth in the list, because of John Snow, whose lecture room we're in right now, and his work on cholera, which was done however many hundreds of years ago, 300 years ago, something like that. I don't know why I'm looking at Sir David for confirmation <laughs> of this. <laughs> the article talks about contributions of statistics to medicine. It talks about John Snow. It talks about doll and smoking. It talks about Fisher and Pearson for their general contributions. And it mentions one living statistician. David and he talks about his work and, and that, that was really terrific. Uh, I should say personally he's, he's the, the, the greatest man I've ever met. I'm going to fill up in a minute. Um, <laughs> not just for his academic contributions but for his humility and his kindness to other people and, and for his little known sense of devilment. Um, <laughs> he, he, he does remember. <laughs> he, ca he came to Newcastle five, six, seven years ago uh, and volunteered to have his second ever motorcycle ride. Uh, Fifty years, I believe, after his first ever motorcycle ride. <laughs> um, I, I believe he enjoyed it. Uh, we've not discussed it, uh, but I'm sure he's taken that up as a hobby since then. We, we <laughs> and he certainly never returned to Newcastle since then. <laughs> right, so, so that was... That was uh, 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 sorry about that. Um, the purpose of the, this explained variation, the main use of it, in my opinion, is to bring some reality to interpretation of covariate effects. So this slide shows uh, a number of well-known data sets from the literature, most of which have been many times analyzed. 
they've all got uh, a number of covariates which are um, highly significant. So, so the, this is the deviance test for, for zero covariate effect versus the number of covariates, uh, and they're all huge. With the exception of PBC, the V, the explained variation, is small throughout. PBC of 43%, I've never seen a value that high before or since. Everywhere else, 20% would be very high. And so that, that just reminds us that despite the fact that covariates can be highly significant, despite the fact that hazard ratios might be quite large, in terms of individual survival, there's still a lot of variability left over. Okay, let, let's, let's, let's look at why that might be. So let's, let's, let's now remind ourselves of, of R squared in linear regression. And we'll take the simplest possible case where there's a single binary covariate, so we've just got two groups. Now we'll look at normal distributions. A little bit later, I'll truncate them at zero, so, so they're non-negative. That won't make any difference. Uh, we'll assume that, that, that we've got some sort of a reference population. That would be the black curve. And then uh, a treated group, the blue curve. Then the standard R squared in, in, in linear regression compares the within-group variation with the between-group or marginal variation. And if we have a look at it, that's about 80% uh, for this set of data. Okay. And it clearly depends upon how separate the groups are. So uh, if we just put a few more plots on there. Uh, I'm quite interested to know what's coming here, because <laughs> this is a draft of the talk that I must have left on the stick, whereas I changed the talk uh, on, on my laptop. Um, so anyway, so, so it's as much a surprise to, to, to me as this is to you, uh, to you what's coming next. <laughs> okay, so, so, so as, as the groups separate, R squared goes up. R squared is a measure of separation between these densities. Now, let's think of this in terms of, of, of a way we, we would summarize survival data. We tend not to use densities. So hopefully this is the right slide next. Yeah. So, 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 so the densities are used for, for, for regression, but not in survival. Let's just take the same situation where R squared was 80%, and we'll turn those PDFs with the truncation at zero into survival curves, and then we'll turn the combination of PDF and survival into a hazard, and then we'll look at the ratio of the hazards, and that's what we've got down the bottom right. So to get densities like, like we have in the top left, that's the ratio of hazards that's required in the bottom right, uh, uh, which doesn't go to infinity, but goes way, way off the scale at lower times. Now, when we fit proportional hazards model, we start with the assumption that the hazards are proportional. So now, let's assume that the black curve stays the same, uh, but to construct the blue curve, we'll start down the bottom right, hopefully, with a constant hazard. So I've done that, and I've taken a, a hazard ratio of 10, which is huge, bigger than you'll probably ever see in real life. And we calculate the hazard for the blue compared to the black one. It's one-tenth of it. And then the survival function, and then the densities. Uh, R squared there with the question mark is now 39%. Uh, the question mark is because the variance now depends upon groups. And so what I've done is I've taken the average variance within groups and compared that with the marginal variance. <laughs> and we see two effects. One, there's less, less separation in location between the two groups. And secondly, there's more variance in the blue group. If we take a, a smaller hazard ratio, so five, so that's still big, that those effects are even more pronounced. So there's rather little variation between the locations of the two groups. R squared is now 30%, uh, and there's more variability <coughs> in the blue group. So when we assume proportional hazards, we're not usually changing locations, not by very much. We're changing the distribution shape uh, and, and the variance of the distribution. If you wanted to say, well, we would never have a, a normal distribution for a PDF in survival, I've done the same for a Weibull. So this is now taking the reference population to be Weibull, and doing the same trick, starting with a proportional hazards uh, model with a, a, rate, uh, uh, sorry, a multiplicative factor of five and going backwards, and it's even worse than it was before. And that's essentially why we should expect low explained variation when we measure variation by changing location. Um, <coughs> how else might we compare these two groups? Well, you might think, well, let's suppose we choose somebody at random from the blue group and choose somebody at random from the black group and ask the question, what's the chance that the blue person has a higher survival time than the black person? Okay, and that's a measure of overlap between the two distributions. And if we do that, and I've turned it into to, to a, a 0 to 100 scale, 
by uh, doing twice that probability, minus 1 multiplied by 100, then we get the green curve there. And that's another way of, of, of measuring explained variation in this very general sense. Um, if the two curves were identical, so if the blue sat on top of the, the black curve, then that, that probability would be half. Two people chose at random, one's equally likely to, be, uh, to have a spiral time longer than the other. Um, if the two groups were entirely separate, it would be 1. And so this probability, T2 bigger than T1, is essentially between a half and 1. That's the basis of something called Harold's C index. So Harold proposed this in 1982, and he just said, take a sample and look at how many pairs of, 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 of observations, if you choose them, and to look at all possible pairs, are concordant. Concordant means that the order of the survival times matches what you would expect from the order of the, the hazard functions or in turn the, 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 the prognostic, prognostic indices beta x. So in this case, beta x for the, the blue group is less than it is for the black group. As it is lower, you expect survival to be higher, so you would expect T2 to be bigger than T1, and that would be concordant. And then Harold suggested just look at all pairs where you can decide whether or not they're concordant. Of course, if you've got censoring, that makes it a bit awkward. There's been a number of attempts to deal with censoring, uh, and I'll mention one of them, which is due to uh, Gonan and Heller in the biometric paper. And they worked out what the probability of this is, given that proportional hazards model was true. And it turned out to be a function that looks a bit like this. And then they said, let's just estimate that function. This is a function of the, the, the beta x for our subjects in the data set, uh, and, and consequently through beta hat, our estimated coefficient. But the actual survival times are no longer used. They've been uh, integrated out, assuming the model is correct. So now we've lost all touch with our actual response times. This is essentially just a function of beta hat. The same is true for another measure of explained variation that was... Um, whoops proposed by Nagelkirk, if you look at multiple linear regression, then the likelihood, apart from constants, is just the same as the residual sum of squares. So the, the residual sum of squares without covariates and with covariates is essentially, the, if you look at the ratio of those, it's essentially the same as the likelihood ratio. And so he, he or she, I don't know this person, uh, proposed that we should use as R squared just a scale form of the likelihood ratio. Uh, the likelihood without covariates we think will be quite small, with covariates we think will be, we hope will be quite large, and we'll use that as an R squared measure. But it's not really R squared; it's, a, it's just a function of, of, of beta hat and the likelihood. Here are some results from from a, a small, smallish, I think it was 230, 240 observations, a set of data on lung cancer survival. We got a sequence of covariates, many of which are, are highly significant. The many years when we, you used um, S plus, R, or any of the, the standard packages, that's all you got, the betas and, and, the, and the zeds. Uh, highly significant likely ratio test. Nowadays, you get R squared out of R. You've had that for about, about eight, eight, nine, ten years, maybe. Uh, and, and in the last year, we now get the concordance index as well. Um, the probability that if you take two people at random, their survival times are concordant with their uh, prognosis indices. So we get those. Uh, I can't resist repeating, I've used this several times, an example that, that my friend and colleague Yanis Stare came up with. Here, here we have simulated data, it was a massive sample, 10,000 I think, from an exponential distribution with a single covariate. When x is naught, uh, we have uh, an exponential survival curve, and that's a capital Mi through it. When x is 1, there's a huge hazard ratio with a beta of 5, so a uh, hazard ratio of e to the 5, that's massive. And the survival curve for, for that group of people, you can just see this thickening down here. It just comes away from the axis there. They almost all have the event immediately. Okay, so we look at R squared for that set of data. What do we learn by knowing which group somebody is in? If you fit an exponential model, which is the correct model, you get 97% explained variation according to the nagel curve measure. That's very impressive. If we fit a Weibull model, now remember that the Weibull model includes exponential as a special case, and so it's A, a correct model for these data, and B, it cannot fit any worse. There's not much room for R squared to go up, is there? 
So it comes down instead. Now we get a, an R squared of 83% if we fit a Weibull to this. And if we fit a Cox model, you can see the direction of travel, <laughs> which is yet again a bigger model. It includes Weibull as a special case, it inclu which includes exponential as a special case. It comes down again. Now the reason for that is that if you look at R squared, what's happening here is it's the numerator that's changing. The numerator is the fit of that model ignoring covariance. How well does my marginal survival function fit? When we fit the exponential, we're forcing an exponential curve into the average of these two. And it doesn't fit very well, because the average of them is not exponential. The Weibull curve is a bit more flexible. So the, the, the likelihood under the, under the null is a bit bigger. And the same again for Cox. So it's not really a, a, an impressive measure of R squared. Well, we don't have to use it. If you look at how many attempts have been in the literature to propose measures of explained variation, then here are some of them. Uh, there's too many to fit on the page, and there's quite a lot of falling off the bottom of the list. I'll mention one due to Babak and his colleagues. Where's Babak gone? Um, he's there. So there's a, if you want to know more, there's a nice review in the Statsy Medicine paper in 2011. Uh, very nice, but not important enough to show on this page, I'm afraid. Um, uh, these are all different attempts in the stats or epidemiological literature literature to propose a measure of explained variation. Each one, there are a few reviews in here, but apart from those, each one says what's gone before is no good whatsoever, he's a better one. And that lasts for about six months till another one comes along. They're all in the theoretical literature. In terms of use in practice, um, I did a citation count on all of the ones up to 2000, so they've had plenty of time to, to find their way out into to the, the wide world. And if we look at the citations, this is what we get. This one, you probably can't read the bottom axis. This is, Nag is the Nagelkirk one that I've just criticised. That's well used. This is the Harrell one, which is subject to, to difficulties with censoring. This one is, is Erika Graf's version of the Schemper measure, and that's pretty good. Um, that one there, that you can't read that. That's Henderson 95. Uh, that's the paper that I mentioned right at the start. Uh, which hasn't do, done too well in terms of citations, but it's not the worst. That's Henderson 96. <laughs> um, that, that I was pleased to find matches a paper by Sir David with zero citations so far today. Uh, I've given this part of the talk several times before. I thought fairly recently, and then I looked back, and in fact I gave it for the first time here in this building, London School <laughs> of Hygiene, uh, I just said a year ago. It's actually two and a half years ago. Uh, so that bar chart is, is over two years old. And therefore, last week I updated it to see what's been going on. And the Nagelkirk and the Harrell one are still getting cited. These are Web of Science citations, so people are still using these. Uh, and sadly, uh, I, haven't, uh, I haven't troubled the scorer. <laughs> right, let's move on. Uh, I'm aware of the time, so I'm going to go quite quickly now uh, to recurrent event data. Um, now we move away from, from, from single event survival data to more complex situations. Here, here are some data from a larger, uh, a larger data set of about 900 or 1,000 children. And what the plot shows are events in time for 10 of those children. There are three different types of events. There's a, a blue cross, a red cross, and a green circle. A blue cross marks a start, the start of an episode of diarrhea. These are infants in, in Salvador in Brazil. Um, the red cross marks another day with diarrhea in the same episode, and the green circle marks dropout from the study. The grey line is present when the child is under observation, so we can see whether or not they had diarrhea, and it disappears when they're not. So we had some children that joined the study late, we've got others that drop out early, and we've got some where the observation is intermittent. So we've got quite a complex pattern of different types of events and different observation patterns. Can we come up with a measure of explained variation here? Uh, and I'm going to talk briefly about a proposal due to my uh, friend and colleague, Yanis Starry again. And he said, look, I don't care what model you have. You choose the model. This is going to be completely independent of the model you have. Whatever model you get, you choose, you will end up with an estimate of the intensity, the chance of the event, at time t for each child in the study. And so I've stopped the clock here at this, this dotted line, and obviously you would do it at all possible event times. Give me your estimates, and I'll rank them. So there's my, my estimates. I've just made up these numbers. 
for, for these ten children. Uh, and I think child number six is quite likely to have the event at the dotted time uh, because they're, they're quite susceptible to it. Child number eight is not likely to have it because they're not susceptible. And so now they're a model and it's fitted. Then I'm going to try and measure how well my model fits by looking at the ranks of these. Uh, let's look at, uh, at who actually has the event at time t. I'm going to assume somebody has the event. Uh, and let's suppose it was person number nine. Uh, my arrow's dropped a little bit. I don't know why. That's age. Um, and that was uh, the, 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 the person who had intensity three. Okay. So according to my model, that person was most likely, and then this person, number one, uh, and then number ten, and number nine. So it was the fourth most likely who had the event. So the argument runs as follows. The rank of my event under the model was number four. If I was, uh, if I had perfect knowledge, if I was God, I would know exactly who was about to have the, attempt, to have the event. So, so my, my, my calibration number is one. That's the best I can possibly do. If I had no knowledge, there were nine people in that data set. Okay? So on average, the rank of the, 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 the estimate would be uh, number five, halfway through that list of one to nine. So we think of the difference between the rank uh, under no knowledge and perfect knowledge as what we need to explain, and contrast it with that with the difference between the rank under no knowledge and what my model thinks. And we say that's what we have explained. And then we'll try and summarize that by, by, by looking over all event times, and we'll take the, the ratio of what we want to explain and what we have explained, uh, the other way around. And you can formalize that, uh, and you get a measure that involves the inverse probability sensor and you count the process and so on, but it can be done. Okay, okay I'm going to move on. Uh, uh, Daniel did give me permission to overrun by a few minutes. Um, just to talk about some, some areas of current work. It's not really mine. One area is, 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 is added value. If you add covariates into a model, what do you gain? Now the reason for interest in this is, is all the effort that goes into collecting genetic information, and is it worthwhile? What do we gain if we, if we spend a huge amount of money and time collecting ge genetic information compared to just knowing somebody's age and sex and body mass index? So again, for this simple and small data set, I looked at uh, Harold C. and, and the, the Niagara Kirk R squared. If only activity score was in the model, that's the most significant covariate with a, a Z score of 4.38. And then we add the covariates one by one. And you can see that the C in particular hardly changes. Now, some people, there are two points of view now. Some people say, well, that's life. That's what happens in real life. H adding these covariates doesn't give you much predictive power. Other people say, no, it's the C statistic that's wrong. What we need to do if we don't like the results is we'll change the statistic. And so there's been work recently on, on, on classification, where, where you classify people into risk groups. In the literature, it's always binary. We look for papers by Pencina and his colleagues for this. Uh, so you look at people who survived 10 years versus people who didn't survive 10 years, and you compare what actually happened with what your model predicted. And then you see how the, the classification changes, we're moving into discrimination now, as you introduce covariates. And I've done that, uh, we, we, we don't want binary, this is a survival meeting, so I've done it for, for, for three classes of outcome for the lung cancer data. So, uh, so I classified what actually happened as they live for, they live for weeks, they live for months, or they live for years with some fuzzy boundaries between the, the, the two, the, the, the groups. And on the bottom is what actually happened, and on the top is, is what you would predict, what, what the most likely prediction was if you used activity score only, and there's one dot for each person. Uh, and I did this plot on Sunday in R myself, and I'm very, very proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> it gets better as well. And then we say, what happens if we reclassify? Well, if, if we reclassify, the, the outcomes are going to stay the same. They don't change. But the groups we put people in are going to change. And I'm going to go straight from activity to everybody, so, so, sorry, to having all the covariates in. And these people are going to move. So the blue people uh, are going to change their classes. OK, and let's do that. And this is what they change to. So the green means they moved in the right direction. So that was somebody who was um, classified as good became classified as medium. The red is they move in the wrong direction. So a medium probably went down to a poor. And then there are attempts now to, 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 to quantify this, either by looking at the overall numbers that moved or the subgroups, how many poors moved in, in, in the right direction or the wrong direction it would have to be, and so on. 
And there's lots of attempts to do that. Uh, that's about it. I think I'll just, 30 seconds on three of the topics where people I know are working at the moment. Uh, th there's work on, on, on trying to get measures that uh, are robust to misspecification of the model, so they accept you're fitting the, the wrong model, but, but try to still come up with something that's, that's practically useful. There's work on, on, on subset identification. So the argument here is that if it's expensive to collect covariate information, you don't want to do it for the very, very high risk group because you can do nothing about those people. You don't want to do it for the very low risk group because you don't need to do anything about those people. What you want to do is, is, is to find a way of discriminating amongst the middle risk group. And so can we identify a subset where we should, uh, we have the opportunity to explain more variation? And, and finally, a, a personal issue. Um, I, I started off in the 90s looking at prediction, and, and many of the papers that I talked about previously used prediction in the title, but they don't mean prediction. They mean estimation. Um, I think the rule of thumb, which I'm, I'm trying to get people to use, uh, and so far there's only me and my PhD students using this rule of thumb, and, and then only until they get their degrees, um, <laughs> is that we predict something that we will eventually observe. So we will predict somebody's survival time. We will predict whether they're going to live five years. We'll predict whether it rains tomorrow. But we'll estimate a parameter or a distribution that we'll never know whether we're correct. The probability of rain tomorrow or living ten years or the distribution of survival. And I've noticed that a couple of papers now are using prediction in what I thought of as the proper sense. Sorry, I've overrun, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Right, we have time for a couple comments or questions. So I can see one up here. Th thank you very much. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, I'm wondering what your opinion is on the C index as a measure of added value of a covariate. Uh, that, that puts me on the spot, rather, doesn't it? Um, I think the C index itself is okay. I don't have any problems with C index. It's fine. Uh, I worry when people look at small differences in the C index and, and say that that's really important because it's gone from 0.652 to 0.657 or something like that, which you do see. Uh, uh, so I think it's more, more, more over-interpretation of the C index that I'm concerned about, not the statistic itself. Yes, uh, Robin, I, I really enjoyed your, uh, your talk. I, I think it's a very important uh, area uh, in terms of uh, fixing the ideas in medical minds, not only in the minds of statisticians, because in the work that we have done in breast cancer, the models uh, that we use for prediction uh, usually contain uh, quite a lot of information, but we're never sure that the, that the medical doctors that we're dealing with, the oncologists that we're dealing with, for example, have the same, have the same model in mind. And it's interesting to uh, really speculate on the treatment regimens that they, they might allocate to their patients if they had a better idea of the the true, in inverted commas, the truth about the survival of their patients. In many cases, the, uh, the idea might be that they would be more aggressive in, in treating patients. I think the issue is, is, is that there's a lot of individual variation, and, and any two people are going to have very different outcomes despite having the same covariates. So, so the, the models and the covariates are useful at the population level, one group might have a 5% increase in survival probability over another, and that's worthwhile. But, but for me and you, uh, you know, your, your probability might be 0.5 of living the next 50 years, <laughs> uh, 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 and mine might be 0.45. Uh, and, and that, w when we only, if you th think about a biased coin, okay, if you have one, co one, one throw of a coin, you'd rather have the 0.5 than the 0.45, but it's not a lot of difference, is it? You wouldn't bet a lot on the 0.45.
other questions? I have one for you. The, um, you've obviously developed this for survival data, but can you use the same idea going back to continuous data, comparing the, the ranks of the whatever, linear predictor or something, to the ranks of the data? And does that map onto anything that exists well, Already. obviously, there, there are lots of different measures that we could map on the, the rank correlations and mm. things like that. Yeah. But clearly, there are. I, th I think we, 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 the, the SARI at R1 is really designed for sort of complex situations where you've got time varying covariates and time varying coefficients. So there's not just just a simple single predictor available at time zero, but more, but, but more variable than that. Mm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So there's clearly links between uh, between this and the C index and. and measures any, any concordance index or, or rank correlation. So just thinking about uh, predicted risk, people will sometimes get very concerned or sometimes very unconcerned about the uncertainty in predicted risk. And I wanted to just sort of think about your comment about whether you had a 50% a chance or a 45% chance. The greatest variability is in the individual, what happens, that, bin that Bernoulli chance, if you like. Yes. That's the that's variability at the individual level yes. which dominates everything. Yes. So I sort of wonder when, when we develop um, prognostic models, thinking about interpretation in terms of individual prediction, we shouldn't be necessarily so concerned about the uncertainty in the overall risk prediction, but because it's so much dominated by the uncertainty and the binary probability that, affect, that applies to the individual. And I just wonder whether you agreed with that or not. I do. <laughs> not much more to say, but, but, but precisely. In terms of individual predictions, it's very, very difficult. <coughs> uh, we're not good. Uh, especially within a proportional hazards, for the reasons I've tried to explain previously. We're, we're not getting the separation in, in, in densities, in, in the location of densities within that class of model. This is not a criticism of the model. The model's tried and tested for 41 years. It fits real data. Uh, so that's just what the data are like. It's not, like what, it's not, it's not a criticism of, of our assumptions. In terms of uh, risk scores, I mean, I, I guess everybody. Uh, you can, you can do online risk scores now uh, and, 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 and estimate your 10-year heart attack-free probability and so on. So if you just Google Framingham risk score or something like that, you can do it. And you put in your body mass index and your blood pressure and things. And, and, and the best way to, 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 to influence what the outcome is, just, just change your, your values if you don't like them. So, so, <laughs> so, so uh, I put mine in. I have a 10.8% chance of a heart attack in the next five or 10 years. So I just lowered my um, body mass index like, numerically and, and it became all well. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually reduces my risk of a heart attack, doesn't it, if I'm happy? <laughs> <laughs> There's some uh, difficult causal questions there. I think. <laughs> we have time probably for one more question or comment. Well, if not, uh, can we thank Rob once again?